Hi everybody, my name is Michael Demang and welcome to Strange Tales of Myth and Magic. In this podcast, we're going to explore mythology and magic and fairy tales and wives tales and maybe some snakes tales. We'll take a peek at some of the strange legends and stories throughout history and how they affected culture and how they affected me as an artist. So sit back and let me tell you a story. This week's episode, Medusa, Sympathy for the Gorgon. Now, is it possible that anybody out there doesn't know who Medusa is? She has to be one of the most recognizable mythological creatures um, on the planet. I I just cannot imagine. I I don't care what part of the globe you're on. I would really, really be surprised if if you've never, ever heard of the snaky-haired woman, Medusa. So, of course, the challenge is that um, how do I tell you stuff that you don't already know? I mean, do you already know everything there is to know about Medusa? Well, we'll, we'll see, because I've managed to dig up some stuff that might surprise you and some stuff that you might know. But I suppose what we need to do to start off is to make sure everybody, even if there's one person out there who's never heard of Medusa, we need to make sure that that we understand who and what she is. Medusa is what's called a Gorgon. So a Gorgon is a snaky-haired creature, little snakes swirling around in its hair. And in fact, if you look at old, old art from ancient Greece, you'll actually see this big monstrous face and big beady eyes, a big wide face with all these coily snakes coming out of its hair. Now, if that's not bad enough, if that's not frightful enough, the thing is, if a Gorgon looks at you, you turn to stone. You turn into a big pile of rock, like a big statue. Maybe that's where all the Greek statues came from. Now, I'm speaking about Gorgons like they're a species, like there's a whole species of Gorgons. Well, there are said to be a total of three Gorgons, Medusa and her sisters Theno and Ephriali. Now, the thing is, Medusa, of those three, is, in some variations, the only mortal one. She's the only one of those three Gorgons who can be killed. The other two, um, Steno and Ephriali, are eternal, are immortal. Now, this is a key component to certain Medusa myths, which we'll get into in a little bit. Now, some legends have it that these sisters, the Gorgon sisters, were actually like this all their life. They were born as monsters. In fact, their parents are actually considered to be the, basically, the parents of monsters. Now, their mother, Kita, and their father, Forcus, were both primordial sea gods. In art, Kita, um, she's actually depicted pretty normally. She kind of looks like, you know, classic Greek woman. Doesn't look like she would be the mother of of beasties. Um, Now, Forcus, on the other hand, he's kind of a weird looking dude. He's he often will have sort of mermaidy sort of tails or claws, you know, like uh, crab claws, you know, coming out. I mean, he'll have human upper torso, but also some crab claws coming out with, with sort of a body that looks, you know, like a red lobster shell. So this couple is said to be responsible for all the sea monsters in the world. So along with the Gorgons, they also um, were the parents of sirens, you know, who were the were the women who would hang out by the shore and, and lure sailors to their doom. Another offspring was a sea serpenty creature named Laden, sort of a dragon, a water dragon of sorts. There's also Echidna, which um, this is a half snake, half woman creature. Now, if you ever saw Clash of the Titans, um, that that Medusa depiction would actually be closer to um, Echidna. Um, but also, there have been depictions of of her as having two snake, like instead of legs, they'd be like snake bodies. In fact, it kind of looks like the Starbucks logo. You know, it looks like instead of two little two little mermaid tails, it would be two little snaky tails. Perhaps most notably, um, the Gorgons are also related to the Graia, the three sisters, the gray witches, who are sort of these nefarious soothsayers. 
Now, it's easy to identify uh, the Graia because um, they are all blind and they all share one singular eye, which they pass around between them. So nobody can see unless they have possession of the eye. And in some versions, they actually have an opening in the middle of their forehead, which they plunk it in, bloop, and then they can see. And they also share one singular tooth. And that's how they eat. They pass the tooth around to, to cut their food. This seems weird to me. It seems like a knife might be handier than a singular tooth, but okay. That, you gotta do what you gotta do. Now, we're gonna come back to these three sisters because they play a crucial role in the tale of Medusa. But what a crazy family. Um, I, you know, very, um, I don't know, Adam's family-ish. Actually, you know what? I, I actually think this might actually make for a good reality show, sort of a keeping up with Kardashians might be more appropriate. You know, you can imagine the, 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 the strains and the, the arguments and, you know, and, and Thanksgiving dinner where the Grya are always slow cutting their food and their food's always cold by the time, you know, they actually get to eat. And of, of course, then you have the problems with the Gorgons because, you know, they try and, you know, go on dates and of course their dates, you know, turn to stone, which, you know, so, so I, I don't know. I think it, I, I might make a pitch. I might make a pitch. I think that'd be kind of a good show. I'd, I'd watch it. So we all know what a a Gorgon looks like, right? Okay, the snaky hair, um, you know, ugly, turn you to stone, that sort of thing. But early depictions of the Gorgons actually have them having these big tusks, you know, like boar tusks. And they have wings. Now that's something that's that you don't see very often in, you know, contemporary depictions of Medusa. But early versions of the Gorgons actually have them with these these wings. So not only could they turn you to stone, um, but they could also fly after you. There are some mosaics of Medusa in which you see these little wings coming off her forehead, you know, almost her eyebrows. It's kind of kind of like a unibrow, I, I guess sort of a, a functional unibrow. I think those little wings could make her fly, perhaps. I don't know. They, they seem like they wouldn't carry much weight, but who knows? It's mythology. So um, to prepare myself for this podcast, I, I took it upon myself to watch the 1964 film, The Gorgon. Now, The Gorgon is a film that was produced by Hammer. Um, Hammer did all the Dracula movies and Mummy and Frankenstein movies in the 1960s or so. Vivid colors, very gothic style, uh, sort of the resurgent of, of horror films. But these would often star... Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. And um, usually it was Christopher Lee who would play, you know, a vampire and Peter Cushing would play like Ben Helsing. And, and so I was watching it and it's, it's beautiful. It's that rich, you know, 1960s, vibrant Gothic color. You know, every color is like pushed to the nth degree. And the interesting thing about this film though, is um, usually when you think of Christopher Lee, you think of him as always in these old Hammer films anyway. You think of him as being the villain. He typically is the villain. Um, and you think of Peter Cushing as being the hero. Well, it's almost as if these guys had done so many movies together, somebody said, hey, why don't we swap? So Christopher Lee is the good guy. Peter Cushing is the, oh, let's just say he's the villain enabler is what he is in the film. And the premise is that there's a Gorgon, a, you know, woman who turns people to stone. But in this case, um, it is named Magira, who in this story is a sister of Medusa and Stheno. Though I, I think they changed the name of Efriali uh, because it just didn't flow off the tongue trippingly. Uh, Magira does have a, a nicer flow to it. So I, I think they changed it for, for cinematic for cinematic punch. Megira is actually a character in Greek mythology, though. Um, she's actually one of the Furies who were basically in charge of vengeance. They were deities in charge of vengeance. Three sisters, another three. Three seems to be a common, common denominator. So in, in the story, um, in a nutshell, you, there is the spirit of a Gorgon, Megira in this case, um, that has inhabited um, a person. So as the storyline goes, every full moon, Megira 
takes physical form, taking over the body, and then of course you get to see the little snaky hair and sort of scaly skin and this green, emerald, emerald green gown. Now, I have to say, the snake effects in the Medusa um, are worth checking out. Now, they're very fakey. You know, it's she has these snakes propped up in her hair, um, like little rubber snakes. Now, there's some little mechanism that actually makes these snakes sort of uh, bounce around, sort of spastically bounce around. And as fake as this looks, it's also actually pretty cool looking. Now, perhaps the coolest scene in the film is actually at the end. The Gorgon is ominously in the background, sort of visible but not visible. It's a really, really lush scene. The greens with some, some glowing reds. It's just stunning. It's really, really rich in color, but at the same time, eerie and gothic. So I'd say check out the film, or at the bare minimum, I, I think you can actually see that scene, you know, on YouTube or something. So um, check it, you know, check it out. I think um, I, I, it's worth it's worth a peek. When I was a kid, I loved the Haunted Mansion ride, and I remember having the Haunted Mansion soundtrack. I play it on my record player, and I, I went every time we would go to Disneyland, which was actually pretty frequent. Um, I would go on that ride over and over again as many times as I possibly could. Now, my favorite part of the ride is Madame Leota. And that is the part where there's a seance and then there's a woman's face inside a crystal ball. Fall in from the spirits, wherever they're at. And no body, her head is just inside a crystal ball. And I always thought, as a kid, I always thought that was Medusa. And part of that is that, you know, her hair is kind of crazy inside the ball. And, um, you know, her voice is sort of ominous and scary like Medusa. But I suspect it has a little bit more to do with the fact that Madame Leota looks like she's missing her body. She's just the head. And that is kind of a key element to most of the Medusa myths. The quest to decapitate the Gorgon. Now, this legend has a lot of variations, but basically it centers around one hero, Perseus. So without going um, into great detail, background, because, you know, there's a lot of story behind Perseus, but he's a demigod, which means he is part man, Part God. His father was Zeus. He, Zeus, being a, a sneaky guy, showed up to his mother Danae in the form of a golden shower, and she was impregnated, and there was Perseus. Now, they had some trials and tribulations. They were set, to dr set adrift and, and ended up on this little island. Perseus and his mother were taken in by a kind fisherman, and um, Perseus was pretty much, you know, raised to, you know, to work a boat and, and catch fish and, and that sort of thing. So, a, a simple life. And he was content to do so until um, a king um, of the island, Polydectus, um, was kind of had a kind of had a, a thing for Perseus's mom. Now, for some reason, the king was worried. Perseus would be a bit of a problem. So he concocted a way to, um, to get rid of Perseus. And the way he did this was simply by saying, gee, I'd really love to have a Medusa's head on my mantle. That would be the best thing ever. I can't imagine a better present. Well, and young Perseus is eager to impress, and so he immediately sets off on a quest to kill Medusa. Now, unbeknownst to Perseus, the evil king had um, pretty much plotted that um, this was a suicide mission. Anybody who goes near the Gorgon's island is doomed. Now, there are certain advantages to being a demigod, and um, many of which means you have buddies in high places. So, all of a sudden, as he's starting off on his quest, Perseus is visited by none other than Hermes, the messenger god. And Hermes is all decked out in his sort of wingy outfit. He's, he's got shoes that have little wings on it, a golden and a little hat with little wings on it, and a staff with wings on it. He had definitely had sort of a wing thing going on with his ensemble. And Hermes is like, hey, you're going to need more than courage, buddy boy. So uh, we need to go visit the Grey Witches. Let's go!
The messenger god then explained to Perseus that the Gryia sisters, the Grey Witches, were the only ones who knew where the northern nymphs lived, the Hyperboreans, because they actually had some goodies that would help Perseus out on his quest. So the Gryia sisters actually lived in sort of a twilight zone. And what I mean by that, it actually is a place that you know, the sun would never shine and the moon would never glow. So it's always on the in-between, a sort of a gray land appropriately for the three sisters. So Perseus snuck into the cave, creeping as quietly as he could, watching the three sisters, going back and forth, shifting around, moving their eye from person to person, sharing their eye, careful not to be seen, cautiously staying in the shadows. And then the moment came, in between eye pass-offs, Perseus snatches it. And they're all freaking out. And at first, they don't know that it's been stolen. It, they actually are blaming each other for it. Where's my eye? Where's my eye? You have my eye. Give me my eye back. No, you have my eye. And they're going back and forth and back and forth. You give me my eye back. Till finally, he says, hey, I need to know where the northern nymphs live. Tell me that. You get your eye back. And they couldn't they couldn't spit out the directions quick enough. Head down Highway 17, take a left at Joey Suvlaki joint, and then you're there. Perseus, as he promised, gives their eye back and heads straight to the northern nymphs. Now, this is a weird little land. Everybody's happy and, and playing harps and dancing and, and singing, and there's like a, a, a sort of an ethereal glow about everything. Quite a contrast to the dour gray cave that he just came from. Everybody's so happy, yay! Have some lamb, have some wine, woo, let's party! So it's here that Perseus gets his Gorgon hunting kit. Hermes gives him a pair of his very own winged sandals. Um, meanwhile, Athena, a goddess of wisdom, uh, shows up and she gives him a bronze shield. Now, this shield is actually super shined. It's like it has been so shined up that it is a mirror. And she explains to him, look, you can't look Medusa in the face, but there's nothing to say. You can't look at her through a mirror. Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, uh, supplies him with a sword that is strong enough to cut through Medusa's scaly neck. And Hades shows up with a helmet that makes the wearer invisible. Very handy indeed. Now the nymphs had a gift for him as well. Um, they actually had a little silver satchel, um, which the satchel would actually form fit around anything you put in it. So before Perseus heads out, he's warned by the gods that, remember, there are three of them. Um, Medusa is the only mortal one. The other two sisters cannot be killed. So put your energy on Medusa and make sure the other ones don't see you. And then Perseus gets direction to the Gorgon's Island. Now, this is a place that's beyond the ocean. Now, remember back then, um, the world was seen as like a big platter. So there really wasn't much beyond the ocean. And it was also beyond night, you know, because past daylight, there was nothing, right? Just blackness. So that's where he had to go. So the island is all rocky and crumbly and ruinous. There are stone figures everywhere from unsuccessful attempts at Medusa's life. Wearing his helmet of invisibility, his sword at hand, and his shiny, shiny shield, Perseus quietly, cautiously, sneaks to the Gorgon's lair. Now remember, so he's invisible, but the problem is, if he looks any of these snaky women in the eye, invisible or not, he'll be turned to stone. Finally, he finds Medusa. She's laying down, she's asleep. And using his shield, peeking through it, he takes his sword and shloop, chops off her head. Now, the weird thing is, is out of her neck pops Pegasus, you know, the flappy wing horse. And then also Chrysaur, a, a golden giant. Medusa was pregnant, and, and these were the children of, of hers and Poseidon. Now, I'll return to that topic in a bit. The other two Gorgons are waking and realized what has just happened and are freaking out. Now, of course, the advantage that Perseus has is a couple things. First off, he takes to the air, and he's flying away in his little shoes, and he's invisible. So 
Medusa's sisters cannot track him down, but they do give out a horrible, horrible, horrible shriek. Now, the goddess Athena hears this. I mean, you're a goddess, you hear lots of things. And she's like pretty impressed. She's like, whoa, that is quite the sound. So it said in an attempt to replicate it, she invented essentially the pan flute. The, the problem was, as that, as that legend has it, the, as she played it, as she played the sound of the screaming gorgons, um, she saw herself slowly, gradually getting uglier and uglier. And that's when she decided maybe she should take up the violin instead. Now, back to Perseus. Perseus um, was flying around on his little winged shoes, and um, he comes across um, Andromeda, who's a beautiful Greek princess um, who is um, currently being sacrificed. Apparently, Andromeda's mom um, decided to um, say how much more beautiful she was than the Nereides, which are um, basically sea nymphs. And this pissed Poseidon off, so he decided to send a sea monster, which was going to destroy the city. But um, the king pleaded with Poseidon, and um, Poseidon said, OK, um, sacrifice your daughter instead. And she's tied to a rock, and there's a big sea monster ready to gobble her up. And, and using the sword that he, that he killed Medusa with, he whack, chops off the monster's head. Um, and so he, you know, hangs out with Andromeda. They fall in love, and, and he's flying back home. He has some scores to settle. Now, en route, blood is dripping out of the bag. It's dripping from Medusa's head. And it said that um, wherever it hit on the land, there'd be serpents. They would pop up. Snakes, snakes, snakes. And also, it said in the Red Sea, where the red coral come from, that was seaweed until the blood of Medusa hit it and solidified it, turned it into coral. When he gets back home... Uh, he sees his mom. Hi, mom. The evil king is there and he's like, hey, what are you doing here? And sure enough, Perseus whips out his Medusa head and says, here, here's your Medusa head. And then turns the king and all his kingly people into stone. Now, Athena then takes the head and then promptly puts it on her shield. And at that point, the image of Medusa became sort of a protector. Um, in fact, you can look through a lot of the shields of, of ancient Greece and you'll see Medusa's head on there. In fact, you'll see it on coins. It's a symbol of protection. It's kind of like the evil eye um, that you actually see in Greece. And it's, an, and it's typically a piece of jewelry, like an amulet that has an eye on it. And the idea is that it, it wards off evil. So you use something evil to ward off other things that are evil. Kind of like the gargoyles, you know, around Notre Dame. So as an interesting aside, um, one of the things that I learned was that Medusa actually um, is, you know, usually, if not always, I, don't, I can't say for certain, but in ancient Greek art, she is depicted frontally. So you'll see typically her face. And a lot of times it's on shields and platters and that type of thing. So usually a big round face. Um, seldom, if ever, portrayed sideways profile. And that is not usual for that era of Greek art. It's very unusual to see that. Usually everybody, you see all the little profiles and, and that kind of thing. Um, now, what's interesting is this might be a clue as the source of the Medusa myth. Because in Mesopotamia, there was a legend of Humbaba. And Humbaba was sort of a monstrous creature that sort of guarded a forest. And I won't go into the, the tale so much because, you know, that would actually make a good podcast. Um, but Humbaba is um, really ferocious and his looks can kill. It doesn't turn people to stone, but the looks can kill. And the thing is about Humbaba, there's a few things that relate to Medusa. First off, the way he's depicted, he's sort of a lion face. And a lot of times, the lion hair around his face kind of looks like snakes. In fact, it's often described as looking like human intestines, so very snake-like. Now, the other thing that happens to be similar to Medusa is that Humbaba is decapitated and his head is put in a satchel and then taken to a god. Well, very, very similar indeed.
Now, like all myths and legends, um, things evolve. The stories change a little bit here and there. In Medusa's case, she actually gets an origin story. And, and the story goes is that the three Gorgons were not always monsters. They were actually quite beautiful. In particular, Medusa was incredibly beautiful and lots of suitors and all that was great, except she was then raped by Poseidon and she was raped by Poseidon in Athena's temple. Now, Athena um, got pissed, but not at Poseidon. Not at the person she probably should have gotten pissed at. She got pissed at Medusa and she cursed her. And from that point on, she would never be a thing of beauty again. Now, there's a few variations of this, and some have it where she is actually really, really ugly, and that turns people to stone. But there's a, another variation of that where Medusa actually isn't ugly. She's beautiful. It's just that her gaze is deadly. So therefore, by default, she's not somebody you want to be looking at. Now, her sisters were transformed as well, just because they were standing next to her when Athena cursed her. Now, if you take into account this backstory, well, suddenly Medusa isn't the villain in any of these tales. Medusa is the victim. Obviously, she's a victim of Poseidon, but she's also a victim of the gods who plotted her demise. And then, of course, there's Perseus. Now, now Perseus, um, he basically got Medusa's head to impress the king. And, and not to mention, he killed her while she was sleeping. I've always thought the story actually had sort of an element of a detective, film noir style detective story. And in, in that, you know, you have this young, innocent, hopeful girl who you know, has life in front of her. And then um, a powerful man uh, assaults her and takes that all away. But, but not only that, um, a powerful woman then helps and becomes complicit in the crime and ultimately turns the once young, innocent girl into a criminal. And Perseus, being the detective of this version, um, is sent to track down a villain. But of course, it turns out that the real scoundrels are his employers. So in the myth, of course, you have, you know, Medusa being a horrible, horrible monster and, you know, something that would elicit nightmares and children and adults alike, I suppose. Um, but, you know, when you learn a little bit of the alleged backstory, you learn a little bit of how she was created and why she was created, it is pretty clear that the real villains are Poseidon and perhaps just as nefarious Athena. She is responsible for the curse. She is responsible for the ultimate torture of this young girl and transforming her into to a beast. And you could certainly make the argument that any person who died by Medusa's gaze, that would be the responsibility of Athena. She's kind of the Dr. Frankenstein of the Frankenstein tale. She, she is responsible for creating the situation where a vengeful monster comes to exist. And then, as if that wasn't enough, she decides that the monster needs to go and arranges for its destruction. But not only that, Medusa's head is then placed on Athena's shield. And it makes one wonder, was that not the plan all along? To create this monster and then ultimately use it for your benefit. In most of the Greek legends and tales, you know, really, the gods are not the heroes of the story. Um, usually, they are actually the villains. If you, if you look at a lot of the stories, the gods do nasty things. The gods do mean things. Um, they're not necessarily doing things for the right reasons. That said, I think you'd expect a little more from the goddess of wisdom. So was Medusa a, a villain, a monster, a beast? Well, I suppose she was. But, you know, sometimes you need to have a little sympathy for the devil. That's it for this week's episode, everybody. Thanks for listening. Be sure to pop in again. There's going to be new tales of myth and magic popping up in the future. So uh, tell your friends. That's always helpful. And um, if you're interested, stop by my website, 
www.michaeldeming.com and you can see some of the artwork that I create that might relate to what we're talking about. And if you want to delve a little further into the topic, I'll have blog posts that relate to each of these podcasts. So until we meet again, I'll be mything you.